speaker tonight is Dennis Colbert. He's a graduate of Ball State University, has been employed by Merrill Lynch since 1973. He's Vice President, Registered Investment Advisor, and a Certified Financial Manager. Mr. Colbert served two years aboard the heavy cruiser USS St. Paul. He crossed the Pacific four times and participated in Vietnam operations. Dennis is regarded as a knowledgeable individual of the history and story of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis that was torpedoed and sunk during World War II. Mr. Colbert appeared on camera as a naval historian in a film documentary about the USS Indianapolis that was shown on the A&E channel and also the History Channel. He also served as historical consultant to MPH Entertainment of Studio City, California for the production of the film. Additionally, he served as historical advisor to Pangolin Pictures of New York City for their production of a film documentary about the USS Indianapolis that appeared on the Discovery Channel. In 1999, Dennis was a guest speaker in the Fall Lecture Series at the Maritime Museum in Bath, Maine. He is the historian for the USS St. Paul Association and also the editor of the Association's <coughs> quarterly newsletter, letter, The Roving Saint. So I would like to present Dennis Colbert. Thank you, Mary, for the nice introduction, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm here just because of Mary. Mary's daughter, Melissa, happens to be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I served in the United States Navy. If you served in any branch of the Armed Forces or the Merchant Marine, would you please raise your hand? Thank you. I'm going to present a narrative that is a tribute to the men in the ship USS Indianapolis. I'm going to tell the history of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis. I'm also going to tell the story of the USS Indianapolis. It's a story about World War II. It's a story about the United States Navy. It's a story about how men lived and died while serving their country. And it's a story about Indiana. The sinking of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis on July 30th, 1945 by a Japanese submarine was the worst seagoing tragedy in the history of the United States Navy. After being struck by two torpedoes from a Japanese submarine, the ship rolled over and sank in less than 15 minutes. From a crew of 1,197 men, only 317 survived to be rescued four and five days later. While the sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor marks the beginning of World War II for most Americans, the sinking of the Indianapolis effectively marks the end of the war, as the Indianapolis was the last capital ship to be sunk in World War II just days before the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The Indianapolis had delivered a secret cargo to Tinian Island on July 26, 1945, just four days before being torpedoed and sunk. The secret cargo was the atomic bomb which was subsequently loaded onto the Enola Gay and dropped on Hiroshima. Since the sinking in the end of World War II, there's been one court-martial, that of the commanding officer, Captain Charles B. McVeigh III, six books, four film documentaries, and one movie. Sixty years later, the story of the Indianapolis continues to generate public interest as well as controversy. In 1992, Senator Richard Luger appointed a commission to investigate the sinking and the court-martial of Captain McVeigh. The findings of the commission generated another round of controversy. In 1996, congressional inquiries prompted a 44-page report, a three-page summary, and a four-page letter prepared by the general counsel of the Navy. The focus is always on the court-martial of Captain McVeigh. The story of the Indianapolis begins in 1932 when the ship was commissioned. The ship was named after the capital of the state of Indiana. The Indianapolis was the first major combatant naval ship constructed following the London Naval Conference in 1930. As a result of the conference, combat ships were limited in size of tonnage and size of guns. The Indianapolis was built without a heavy armor belt. Later, more and more radar and other heavy gear was added to the superstructure. Admiral Spruance once commented that if the Indianapolis ever took a torpedo hit, she would not likely survive. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was very pro-Navy. During the pre-war 1930s, the Indianapolis became FDR's favorite ship. 
When it was time to review the fleet in New York City Harbor, FDR did so from the decks of the Indianapolis. In 1936, President Roosevelt traveled to South America on a goodwill ambassadorial visit aboard the Indianapolis. The Indianapolis became known as the Ship of State. When World War II broke out, the Indianapolis was conducting exercises a few hundred miles from Pearl Harbor and thus escaped the destruction of the attack at Pearl Harbor. The Indianapolis fought in the Aleutians, and it was in the Aleutians that the Indianapolis suffered its first casualty of World War II when one of its observation planes was shot down. The pilot was killed in action. On August 5, 1945, 1943, Admiral Raymond Spruance was installed as commander of the Central Pacific Force. The first target for Spruance was the Gilbert Islands, an island atoll called Tarara, and a beachhead named Basho. Tarara was supposed to be easy. The island is less than two miles long and only 700 yards wide at the center. But nothing was easy at Tarara. Prior to the landing of U.S. Marines, the Indianapolis and other U.S. ships participated in a well-orchestrated shore bombardment. But the Japanese were fortified, dug in, well-trained, and determined to protect their airstrip. Within 76 hours, over 6,000 men were killed in an area only slightly larger than the Pentagon. 3,400 U.S. Marines became casualties at Basho. The 2nd Marine Division was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. The Presidential Unit Citation awarded to a unit is the equivalent of a Navy Cross being awarded to an individual. The Navy Cross is the nation's second highest award. Four medals of honor were awarded. Three of the medals were awarded posthumously. The fourth medal of honor was awarded to a young colonel named David Shoup. David Shoup later became the Commandant of the Marine Corps. David Shoup was from Indiana. The Indianapolis became Admiral Raymond Spruance's flagship, Fifth Fleet. Admiral Spruance was considered a military and tactical genius. Admiral Spruance, by the way, had been appointed to the Naval Academy from Indiana. Admiral Spruance chose the Indianapolis as his flagship because he wanted a ship that was fast enough to operate with the carrier task groups, provide the communication services required of a flag officer, and could participate in shore bombardment. And the World War II story of the Indianapolis is the story of the campaigns of the Central Pacific, or vice versa, the story of the campaigns of the Central Pacific is the story of the Indianapolis. After Tarara came the Marshall Islands, Kwajalein, and Eniwetok in early 1944. Lessons learned from the naval gunfire bombardment at Tarara were applied for the pre-invasion bombardment of Kwajalein. Square yard for square yard, Kwajalein received some of the most destructive gunfire of the Pacific campaigns. Following in March and April were the Western Carolinas, and then in June 1944 it was the Marianas and the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, in which hundreds of Japanese planes were shot down and two Japanese carriers were sunk. The Marianas fell, Saipan, Tinian, Guam. The Indianapolis became the first U.S. ship to enter Apra Harbor at Guam after Guam was retaken. For Joe Gallagher, the Marianas fight was his first combat. In 1944, Joe Gallagher was 15 years old. He lied about his age to join the Navy. After completing boot camp, Joe was assigned to the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis. Joe reported aboard Indianapolis in April 1944 and was aboard for all the action with the Marianas turkey shoot. While aboard the Indianapolis, Joe's father passed away. And sisters. When his father died, Joe's mother contacted the Navy and requested that her son be sent home because he was only 15 years old. When the Navy found out that Joe was only 15, he was transferred off the Indianapolis at Pearl Harbor and sent back to the States. Rather than discharge Joe, the Navy gave him a financial allotment for his mother and four younger siblings and assigned him to the heavy cruiser USS St. Paul that was under construction in Quincy, Massachusetts, near Joe's home. St. Paul was commissioned in February 1945 and was assigned to Admiral Halsey's Third Fleet. Joe was aboard the St. Paul as a 16-year-old sailor. When the St. Paul fired the final round of World War II against the home islands of Japan and was aboard the St. Paul in Tokyo Bay when the Japanese surrender document was signed aboard the battleship USS Missouri. Joe Gallagher served out as enlistment aboard the heavy cruiser USS St. Paul and was honorably discharged in 1948 at the age of 19. In September 1944, the Indianapolis turned its firepower on an island called Peleliu. The U.S. commander of the 1st Marine Division expected to take Peleliu in two days. Seventy days later, the island was declared secured. 
Of 10,000 Japanese defenders, only 19 combatants were captured alive. Eleven months later, Peleliu would play a major role in the tragic end of the Indianapolis. After a brief combat appearance in the Admiralty Islands, the Indianapolis returned to San Francisco in October 1944. Captain Charles McVeigh III assumed command in November 1944. By February 1945, the Indianapolis was participating in Iwo Jima operations and also the bombardment of the Japanese home islands. Admiral Spruance, true to his nature and character, raced his flagship from battle group to battle group. Iwo Jima cost the Americans a total of 28,000 casualties, including nearly 7,000 killed. Next was Okinawa. Okinawa is only 325 miles from the Japanese mainland. While Iwo Jima had been defended by 20,000 Japanese soldiers, Okinawa was defended by 77,000 Japanese Army regulars. Very few of them surrendered. But 81 days later, the Japanese 32nd Army no longer existed. Allied casualties totaled nearly 50,000, with 22 ships sunk and 250 damaged. Okinawa was a somber view of what could be expected with the invasion of the Japanese mainland that was scheduled for late 1945. Kamikazes were the main weapon of attack for the Japanese. Conditions often required that a ship go to general quarters one hour before sunrise and remain at battle stations until after sunset. A few crew members at a time were allowed to rotate away from battle stations for meals. At Okinawa on March 31, 1945, the Indianapolis was hit by a kamikaze. Nine men were killed and over 20 were wounded. A hole was blown in the bottom of the ship. After the kamikaze hit, Admiral Spruance transferred his flag to the battleship New Mexico on April 5. The damage control department made emergency repairs. Captain McVeigh received a congratulatory note for outstanding damage control efforts. The ship returned to San Francisco under its own power for complete repair, arriving in early May 1945. During the period of May, June, July 1945, many new officers and hundreds of enlisted men reported aboard for duty. In summary, the Indianapolis was at the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Admiralty Islands, the Solomons, the Aleutians, the Gilbert Islands, Tarara, Basio, Macon, the Marshall Islands, Kawajalin, and Iwitak, the Marianas Turkey Chute, the Marianas, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, the bombardment of the Japanese home islands, and also at Okinawa. But now, the Indianapolis is at Mare Island, San Francisco, and history begins its fateful journey. Sunday afternoon, July 15, 1945, a secret cargo was delivered and loaded onto the Indianapolis. Grover Carver of Monterey, California was one of two sailors who went down onto the pier and actually carried the uranium canisters from the pier to the Admiral's quarters. Of course, the content of the canisters was unknown. The canisters were secured and placed under 24-hour Marine Guard. Monday morning, July 16, 1945, the Indianapolis departs San Francisco on a high-speed run to Pearl Harbor under direct orders of the Commander-in-Chief, President Harry Truman. The speed run to Pearl Harbor was a record and the ship averaged 29 and a half knots. Monday, July 16, 1945, on the exact same day that the Indianapolis departs San Francisco, the Japanese submarine I-58, under the command of Machushura Hashimoto, departs Japan and heads for the South Pacific. From a distance of over 10,000 miles to a distance of a few thousand yards, exactly 14 days later, the two ships would converge. Commander Hashimoto was a graduate of the Japanese Naval College. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was a torpedo officer aboard the Japanese submarine I-24. His submarine launched a midget submarine with two crewmen aboard during the attack. As torpedo officer, Hashimoto was responsible for the midget submarine. The midget submarine attack was a failure. The submarine ran aground twice and the two crewmen had to abandon the sub. Both crewmen became some of the first Japanese prisoners of war when they were captured by American forces. Commander Hashimoto's career as a naval officer officer had not known many successes. He served aboard submarines that were plagued with rats and terrible crew living conditions. The sinking of the Indianapolis would be his first military success of the war, occurring just a few days before the atomic bombs were dropped on mainland Japan. On the exact same morning that the Indianapolis sailed from San Francisco and the Japanese submarine I-24 sailed from Japan, an atomic bomb was exploded in the desert sands of New Mexico. 
The successful test explosion in the early morning hours signaled the go-ahead for the mission of the Indianapolis. The Indianapolis arrived in Pearl Harbor after completing its high-speed run. No one is allowed to disembark. Photographer's mate first class Alfred Sadivi had served three years aboard the Indianapolis. His younger brother Nick was a Marine stationed at Pearl Harbor awaiting further assignment to the fighting in the Western Pacific. Nick goes aboard the Indianapolis and shares a watermelon with his brother. It would be the last time the two brothers would see each other. Ten days later, photographer's mate Sadivi would be lost with the ship. Commander Glenn DeGrave, the engineering officer, receives orders transferring off the Indianapolis. He leaves the ship at Pearl Harbor. Thursday, July 26, 1945, the Indianapolis completes another high-speed run and arrives at Tinian Island. The secret cargo is unloaded. The secret cargo, of course, is the atomic bomb, which will be loaded onto the Enola Gay and dropped on Hiroshima on August 6. The contents of the cargo is still unknown to the crew of the Indianapolis. The Indianapolis departs Tinian for Guam. Saturday morning, July 28, 1945, after a brief stop in Guam, the Indianapolis departs Guam en route to the Philippines. The estimated time of arrival in the Philippines is Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock, July 31. Before departing Guam, the navigator, Commander Johns Hopkins Janney, requests an escort. He is told that no escort is available. The ship had often sailed without an escort and Captain McVeigh did not protest his sailing orders. Dr. Lewis Haynes, one of two medical officers aboard the Indianapolis, had once commented, We'll sail alone and unescorted just once too often, and nobody will come home. Commander Marianas has in his possession highly classified intelligence, the Ultra Report. The Ultra Report indicated that two Japanese submarines, including the Japanese submarine I-58, could be operating in the area on offensive missions. However, the Ultra Report was one week old, and the information contained therein was not provided to Commander Janney or Captain McVeigh. Commander Janney was given a routine sailing briefing that included reports of possible Japanese submarine sightings in the area. Admiral Spruance was in Guam planning the invasion of Japan. Spruance had planned to board the Indianapolis and sail to the Philippines, but he changed his mind on short notice and remained in Guam. However, Lieutenant Commander Cedric Coleman, a member of Spruance's staff, did board the Indianapolis at Guam for transit to the Philippines. A few days later, he would die exhausted in the water trying to assist others. He was posthumously awarded the Bronze Star Medal. Commander Coleman was a graduate of Harvard University. Captain Crouch, a Naval Academy classmate of Captain McVeigh, was in Guam with orders to travel to the Philippines. Rather than fly, at the invitation of Captain McVeigh, he boarded the Indianapolis for the short trip to the Philippines. He was lost with the sinking. Sunday evening, July 29, 1945, Captain McVeigh visits the bridge at approximately 8 o'clock p.m and issues orders to cease zigzagging because of darkness and overcast conditions. He leaves standing night orders that he is to be notified immediately if visibility or conditions change. Two hours later at approximately 10.30, Captain McVeigh returns to the bridge. The message file on the bridge contains radio messages advising that the destroyer escort USS Harris is pursuing a possible Japanese submarine contact along the course of the Indianapolis. Captain McVeigh does not read the message file and retires to his sea cabin. Sunday evening, July 29, 1945, shortly before midnight, the Japanese submarine I-58 surfaces and against a clouded yet somewhat clearing horizon sees the silhouette of the Indianapolis. The I-58 submarine was on the surface for about 50 seconds. Commander Hashimoto immediately orders the I-58 submarine to submerge. Monday morning, July 30th, 1945, approximately 30 minutes after submerging and just minutes after midnight, Commander Hashimoto of the Japanese submarine I-58 launches a spread of six torpedoes. The first torpedo blows off the bow. The second torpedo hits forward of a midship, starboard side. A third explosion occurs and all internal communications are destroyed. The ship lifts slightly to starboard but continues on its forward course. Because internal communications have been severed, Officers on the bridge are unable to contact the engine room and order the engine stopped. The Indianapolis continues to plow itself forward and with the bow blown off is taking on huge amounts of water. Absent new instructions from the bridge, the engine room maintains the last given speed. From survivors' accounts, the propellers of the ships were still turning as the ship rolled over and sank. 
Lieutenant Commander Kyle Seymour is the supervising officer of the deck watch. He is also the first lieutenant and damage control officer. He immediately races from the bridge and goes below decks to survey the damage. He reports back to Captain McVeigh on the bridge that the ship is severely damaged, taking on a lot of water, and going down rapidly. He asks Captain McVeigh if he wants to order an abandoned ship. Captain McVeigh, thinking that the damage may not be so severe, orders Lieutenant Commander Moore below decks to survey the damage again and to try and save the ship. Lieutenant Commander Moore returned below decks and was organizing and leading damage control efforts when the ship capsized. Lieutenant Commander Moore had been assigned to the ship exactly three years to the week. He was posthumously awarded the Silver Star Medal for devotion to duty. Commander Johns Hopkins Janney was a navigator. His family name was Johns Hopkins, as in Johns Hopkins University. He reports to Captain McVeigh on the bridge the extent of the damage. Captain McVeigh orders Commander Janney to the communication center to ensure that a distress message is sent. Although fully aware the ship was sinking rapidly, he valiantly attempted to restore radio communications until the ship capsized and sank. Commander Janney was lost with the ship. Commander Joseph Flynn, the executive officer, reports to the bridge and states the ship is sinking. He advises Captain McVeigh to order abandoned ship. Captain McVeigh orders Commander Flynn below to pass the word to abandon ship. Commander Flynn had already received orders to be transferred to the naval station in Oklahoma. He was told his replacement would be in San Francisco before the ship sailed. No replacement arrived. He was told his replacement would meet the ship at Pearl Harbor. No replacement arrived. He was told his replacement would meet the ship at Tinian. No replacement arrived. Commander Flynn was lost with the ship. He was posthumously awarded the Silver Star Medal. Giles McCoy was a 21-year-old Marine private. He was below decks in the aft portion of the ship when the torpedo struck. The lights went out. Amid debris, overturned gear lockers and bunks, Giles, McCoy, and others helped the wounded and injured untangle themselves from the chaos of the compartment. Word came down from above decks that the hatches were going to be dogged down. In the Navy, when a ship is in danger, the hatches are always dogged down to preserve watertight integrity. Giles, McCoy, and others helped pass the wounded up the ladder until the order was given to dog down the hatches. At that point, anyone who could move under his own power scrambled up the ladder, the hatches were dogged down, and 15 men were sealed in the compartment. Less than 10 minutes later, the ship rolled over and sank. Giles McCoy was the last man up the ladder. Five days later, he'd be one of the last survivors pulled from the sea when he was rescued by the crew of the USS Ringness. Back on the bridge, Lieutenant Jack Orr was officer of the deck. Donald Mack was bugler of the watch. Bugler Mack asked if he should sound the abandoned ship on his bugle. He was told to stand by. A few minutes later, he asked, should he sound the abandoned ship? He was told to stand by. Minutes later, he asked again, should he sound the abandoned ship? He was told to stand by. Moments later, Lieutenant Orr turned to Bugler Mack and ordered abandoned ship. Bugler Mack took this to mean that he should abandon ship, dropped his bugle, and went over the side. Bugler Mack was a survivor of the sinking. Lieutenant Orr had already survived two sinkings. He'd had two destroyers blown out from underneath him. He thought he'd be much safer on a larger ship, like a heavy cruiser. Lieutenant Orr was never relieved as officer of the deck. He still had the con. Dedicated to duty, he remained on the bridge. Lieutenant Orr was lost with the ship. Dr. Earl Henry was the ship's dentist. Dr. Henry was also an artist and was well known for his knowledge in color paintings of birds. Dr. Henry died aboard the ship on July 30th, 1945. Six weeks earlier, he had become a father for the first time when his wife Jane gave birth to their son. Dr. Henry and his son never saw each other. Fifty years after his death, reprints of Dr. Henry's paintings have become prized possessions, and Dr. Henry has become famous for his paintings. There were 1,197 men aboard. Approximately 300 men went down with the ship. Approximately 580 men died in the water over the next four to five days. Only 317 survived. The roll call of the dead included men from 46 of the 48 states and the District of Columbia. There were 41 men aboard from Indiana. Only eight survived. One of the tragic ironies of the sinking is that Japanese submarines were in the process of being ordered to return to Japan. Commander Hashimoto later testified that he had not yet received the order to return home and was on routine patrol when he sighted the Indianapolis. Monday, July 30th, 1945, day one, in the water. Officers and senior enlisted men rallied the survivors into groups. 
Because of the drifting currents, the groups became separated by miles. The men were coated with fuel oil, which provided protection from the sun. Sharks began to appear. Tuesday, July 31, day two in the water. Men who entered the water in a wounded state began dying. As the bodies of the deceased were committed to a watery grave, the surviving shipmates recited the Lord's Prayer. Wednesday, August 1, 1945, day three in the water. Exposure, lack of food and water, and sharks continue to take a toll. Authority, strength, and discipline are in a weakened state. Men hallucinate and swim off. Others simply roll off over and drown. Many planes flew overhead en route to the Philippines or on routine patrol, but the glassy sea and bright sun made it almost impossible to spot men in the water. And besides, there were no reports of any ships sunk or missing. Pilots were not looking for men in the water. Thursday, August 2, 1945, day four, in the water. The sea is covered with hundreds of dead bodies floating in life jackets. Exposure continues to shrink the ranks. Thursday morning, August 2, 1945, at 11.18, a young Navy pilot, Lieutenant Chuck Wynn, flying a routine anti-submarine patrol, noticed an oil slick. Thinking it might be a Japanese submarine, he dropped altitude for a closer look and prepared for a bombing run. Men are spotted in the water. There are no reports of any ship sunk or missing. Lieutenant Gwynn continued to circle the area, counting hundreds of men in the water. He radios his information back to Peleliu. The rescue effort begins. A PBY seaplane piloted by Lieutenant Adrian Marks, a young attorney from Frankfort, Indiana, flies to the scene, arriving in late afternoon. Lieutenant Marks circles the area. Crew members of Lieutenant Marks' plane observe men in the water being attacked by sharks. Against standing orders not to land at sea, Lieutenant Marks, who had never made an open sea landing, lands his seaplane in 12-foot swells and rescues 56 men from the sea. Thursday evening, August 2, day 4, in the water, Lieutenant Commander Graham Clater was the commanding officer of a destroyer escort, the USS Doyle. He'd been monitoring some of the radio traffic, thinking something big was up, and without orders, he reversed course and began a flank speed run to the rescue area. Despite the risk of discovery by any Japanese submarines in the area, Lieutenant Commander Clater ordered two large spotlights turned on as his ship approached the men in the water. One spotlight was aimed towards the clouds to serve as a beacon of hope to the survivors. The other spotlight was beamed toward the water to locate the men. The USS Doyle became the first ship to arrive at the rescue scene, arriving shortly after midnight, Friday, August 3. The Doyle was commanded by Lieutenant Commander Graham Clater. Lieutenant Commander Clater was a native of Indiana. He later went on to become Secretary of the Navy. Dr. Lewis Haynes was a senior medical officer aboard the USS Indianapolis. He spent five days in the water in a life jacket. His original group of approximately 400 men had dwindled to about 50 survivors. As Dr. Haynes was being pulled aboard the USS Doyle, someone asked, who are you? And Dr. Haynes replied, you're looking at what's left of the Indianapolis. Dr. Melvin Modisher was also a medical officer aboard the USS Indianapolis. Dr. Modisher was a graduate of Temple University Medical School and had reported aboard the Indianapolis in November 1944. He was aboard for the Iwo Jima and Okinawa campaigns, the kamikaze attack, and the shore bombardment of the Japanese mainland. Dr. Modisher spent five days in a life jacket before being rescued by the crew of the USS Doyle. Friday, August 3, 1945, day five, in the water. Otha Havens is rescued from the sea by the crew of the USS Ringness. Otha's older brother had been killed in action on the very first day of the war. His older brother was a crew member aboard the USS Arizona. His body still entombed aboard the Arizona. Otha felt he owed something to God for his rescue from the sea. After the war, he attended Fort Wayne Bible College and became a minister. Don Beatty was a 19-year-old seaman from Fort Wayne, Indiana. He spent four days in the water on a floater net. By the time he was rescued by the crew of the USS Bassett, he'd lost 29 pounds. Paul Edward Gill of Huntington, Indiana, son of Mr. and Mrs. Edward John Gill, had served over two years aboard the Indianapolis. He was lost at sea. In addition to his parents, he was survived by his sister and three brothers. Back in the Philippines, the estimated time of arrival in the Philippines of the Indianapolis was Tuesday morning, 11 a.m., July 31. When the Indianapolis did not arrive, her status on the arrival plotting board was moved to the next day, Wednesday. On Wednesday, when the ship did not arrive, 
Her status was again moved to the next day, Thursday. Admiral Nimitz had issued standing orders that the arrival of combatant ships in port was not to be reported. He did not want to broadcast over the airwaves the arrival and location of his combatant ships. The Japanese could track the code and would know the whereabouts of U.S. Navy ships. However, the order was somewhat ambiguously worded in that it did not establish a procedure by which the non-arrival of a ship was to be noted or reported. The Indianapolis was sunk shortly after midnight, Monday, July 30, 1945. By Thursday evening, no one knew that the Indianapolis, a heavy cruiser with 1,197 men aboard, had been sunk and was missing. Both the Marianas Command and the Philippine Sea Frontier failed to monitor the chop line or the change of operational control when the Indianapolis was scheduled to pass from the Marianas Command area to the Philippine Sea Frontier area. At the approximate time that the Indianapolis would have crossed the chop line, the Marianas Command deleted the Indianapolis from its monitoring board. While duty officers in the Philippine Sea Frontier were aware the Indianapolis had not arrived as scheduled, no reporting action was taken. While officers in the Port of Lady were not without blame, it should be noted that it was not unusual for warships to be rerouted while in transit, while at the same time Port Authority officers were often not notified of the changes in routing. As flagship of the 5th Fleet, the Indianapolis was unique. Admiral Spruance constantly changed the sailing orders of the Indianapolis, and the ship was frequently rerouted to accommodate the needs of Admiral Spruance. After the rescue, mid-August 1945, a board of inquiry is conducted. Captain McVeigh is one of the survivors. Captain McVeigh was a graduate of the Naval Academy. His father was also a graduate of the Naval Academy and was a retired admiral who had commanded the Asiatic Fleet. Captain McVeigh was regarded as a fine officer with a good service record. Previously, as the executive officer of the USS Cleveland, Captain McVeigh had been awarded the Silver Star Medal for participating in combat operations in the Solomon Islands. But the law of the sea is very demanding. The privilege of command at sea comes with an uncompromising responsibility. That trade-off is part of the ancient bargain that is struck when an officer accepts command of a ship at sea. December 1945, Captain McVeigh is court-martialed. The Navy holds that a commanding officer of a ship at sea is always responsible and always accountable for the safe transit of his ship. This is a doctrine of command accountability that predates the United States and traces its origins to the British Navy. The doctrine of accountability is strictly applied to command at sea in recognition of the fact that naval ships operate independently, far from assistance, in an environment made hostile by the weather or by enemies. Life at sea is surrounded by dangerous forces. Mistakes or omissions can mean the death of all hands on board. Admiral Chester Nimitz was opposed to the court-martial. He wanted to issue a letter of reprimand to Captain McVeigh instead. He was overruled by Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest King. Captain McVeigh is charged with two charges. The first charge is negligently suffering his vessel to be hazarded or placing his ship at risk by not zigzagging. The second charge is failure to order abandoned ship in a timely manner. Commander Hashimoto, the commanding officer of the Japanese submarine I-58, was brought to Washington to testify at the court-martial of Captain McVeigh. Hashimoto testified that had, had the Indianapolis been zigzagging, he would have had to alter his approach and targeting would have been more difficult, but he nonetheless could have torpedoed the ship. He also testified that he visually tracked the ship for 27 minutes. Captain McVeigh was convicted on the first charge of hazarding his ship or placing his ship at risk by not zigzagging. He was sentenced to lose 100 numbers in seniority within his grade of captain. However, in view of Captain McVeigh's outstanding service record, the court-martial board recommended clemency and the sentence was remitted, but the conviction still stands. He was subsequently promoted to Rear Admiral and awarded the Bronze Star Medal for his actions at Okinawa. Rear Admiral McVeigh retired from the Navy in 1949. On November 6, 1968, Rear Admiral McVeigh committed suicide. Congressional inquiries in 1992, 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000, and in 2001 have focused on the court-martial of Captain McVeigh. In October of the year 2000, as part of the Defense Appropriations Bill, the U.S. Senate and House passed a resolution, a resolution that expresses a sense of Congress 
that it should now recognize Captain McVeigh's lack of culpability for the loss of the ship and crew. On July 17, 2001, the Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England, amended Captain McVeigh's service record to reflect that he is exonerated for the loss of the USS Indianapolis. In the spring of 1946, the Japanese submarine I-58 was escorted out to the deep waters of Sasebo Harbor. Under the supervision of the United States Navy, the I-58 submarine was loaded with demolition charges and sunk. Both the Indianapolis and the I-58 submarine thus ended their service lives at the bottom of the sea. After World War II, Hashimoto continued his maritime career as a merchant ship captain transporting merchandise to his former enemy, the United States. In the early 1970s, in a foggy Japanese port, Hashimoto's ship collided with another vessel. Two crewmen were killed. Hashimoto was disgraced and relieved of his seagoing command. The mission of the Indianapolis ended the war with Japan. Japanese forces were expected to defend their homeland with the same determination they had displayed in earlier battle campaigns of the Central and South Pacific. Relentless bombing of the Japanese home islands, blockades, and naval gunfire had failed to bring Japan any closer to surrendering. Planning thus began for the biggest invasion in military and naval history. The first phase of a two-phase planned invasion was scheduled for November 1, 1945. Phase two was scheduled for March, 1946. General Douglas MacArthur would be Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Army Forces, Pacific. Admiral Chester Nimitz would command all naval action. Admiral William Halsey would be in command of the 3rd Fleet. And Admiral Raymond Spruance would command the 5th Fleet. Admiral Spruance's 5th Fleet consisted of almost 3,000 warships, troop transports, and landing craft. 5th Fleet was charged with covering the assault force and providing support for the troops ashore. Admiral Halsey's 3rd Fleet consisted of 20 carriers, 10 battleships, 75 destroyers, and 20 cruisers, including USS St. Paul. Halsey's armada would provide pre-invasion bombardment and air attacks. A total of 5 million men would be involved in the invasion of Japan. Two and one-half million Japanese Army regulars were positioned to defend against any invasion of their homeland. The Imperial Japanese Navy had constructed hundreds of midget submarines which were to be used as suicide boats against the U.S. Navy invasion fleet. President Truman had been briefed by his staff that the invasion of Japan could be expected to produce hundreds of thousands of U.S. casualties in the first 30 days. However, instead of proceeding with a planned invasion, Truman ordered a new secret weapon, the atom bomb, dropped on Japan. On August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay of the 509th Composite Group lifted off from Tinian Island with the world's first combat operational atomic bomb destined for Hiroshima. Three days later, another atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Japan was forced to surrender. Scores of senior Japanese officers committed suicide. And World War II in the Pacific came to a close. President Truman upheld his responsibilities of leadership and accountability to the citizens of the United States and the free world. If not for the courageous decision of President Truman to use atomic weapons, the greatest invasion ever planned would undoubtedly have resulted in the greatest U.S. casualty list ever imagined. World War II would have lasted beyond 1946 with incalculable human costs. The mission of the USS Indianapolis did indeed bring about the end of the Pacific War. In 1995, a monument was built in the city of Indianapolis. The monument is a tribute to the men of the ship USS Indianapolis. The names of all 1,197 men are inscribed in granite on the monument. The monument is located on Walnut Street, next to the canal, a few blocks north of the circle in downtown Indianapolis. And that is the story of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis and the worst seagoing tragedy at the United States Navy. <clears throat> Someone has a question, I'll be happy to entertain a question. Or not. <laughs> yes, sir. How many men, do you know how many personnel survived today from those? There's a, about 103, 4, 5 uh, survivors right now, including the one, Don Beatty, who actually lives here in the Angola area. He's from Fort Wayne, but he, lived, he, lived up here, he moved up here to the lake area now. So, uh, um. 
How often do they have a reunion? They have a reunion every two years in the city of Indianapolis, and there is one scheduled this year. Uh, I'm not sure the exact dates, but it's usually towards the end of July, right around the anniversary of the sinking or the first part of August. And it is open to the public, most of it, if anyone would like to attend, this, um, sur whoever, however many survivors can attend will be there. The number of survivors attending the reunion is beginning to get smaller and smaller because of age and travel difficulties and so forth. Yes, sir. Um, in some accounts of the uh, tragedy of the Indianapolis, the, uh, the submarine that did the sinking was reported to have uh, a chiton. Yes, board. yes. Uh, was that ever used or was that ever brought up in a court martial that no matter what would happen, they would use the chiton to sink the sub, the uh, Indianapolis, or what effect did that have on the court martial that, that you know of? Any, do you know what? Uh, it is true that the Japanese submarine I-58 did have chitons aboard it, and, and for those who know what a chiton is, it is a, it is a, it's the equivalent of a kamikaze plane, except it's a torpedo that's manned by a person. It is a suicide mission with one person inside, and you steer, you steer the torpedo towards the target. Hashimoto wrote a book in 1954 entitled Sunk, and in his book he states that he did not use the chitons in the attack on the Indianapolis. I'm not sure about your question about whether it was brought up at the court martial, whether it could have been used or, or perhaps not. Yeah, I, apparently, uh, not apparently, but I, I read some accounts and different things, and uh, he fired a torpedo supposedly because the Indianapolis was not zigzagging, but then at the court martial, uh, the defense for uh, McVeigh brought up the fact that the kite down was aboard and there was whether he was zigzagging or not was irrelevant to material because it was still would have been sunk by the kaita. That's perhaps true, yes. And uh, as a matter of, uh, there's a lot of controversy about this zigzagging thing, but I will, I will say that in today's modern Navy, zigzagging is still an integral part of fleet maneuvers and ships are required to zigzag at times. So, depends on who you talk to as to whether, how effective it is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I spent a lot of time reading about this, and I still remember some of it. Zigzagging, arguably, was obsolete by 1943 because of the better torpedoes, the better armament, and the better spread patterns the submarines had. He launched six and yes. hit three times. He launched six torpedoes, yes. Yeah, and three of them missed and three of them were hits. I mean, they had a, such a superior firepower compared to World War I technology, and this Admiral uh, Ernest Kane. King. King, yeah, King. King, King, King. Okay, he was still thinking World War One technology when he ordered the uh, the court martial. Uh, Admiral King was a controversial uh, individual. He was, uh, most people's opinion, he was a real sob. Uh, but uh, in other, you know, there's an old saying: uh, no matter how thin I make my pancakes, they still have two sides. Okay, and, and he may have been an SOB, but he was also chief of naval operations during a two ocean war, and we won. So he has some credit for that. The question you, I mentioned earlier that zigzagging is considered controversial, but it's still used in today's uh, fleet maneuvers. So, and it's something that is practiced because if you can imagine a fleet of ships or a dozen ships that are operating in a task group and they're going to zigzag, that all has to be executed in a very precise and timely manner so that everybody's going the same way at the same time and not zigging versus zagging. So how effective it is here again depends on the, the person you talk to. I've read accounts by U.S. Naval submarine commanders who said that it was not effective, that any ship that was uh, zigzagging, they could torpedo it, whether it was zigzagging or not. And that came from U.S. Naval uh, submarine officers. On the other hand, you'd have to remember that a, a Navy officer would probably not admit that he couldn't sink a ship either, you know, if he was a submarine officer. Uh, yes, sir. With, with the homing devices that we have on torpedoes today, how effective would zigzagging be? That's a good question because uh, torpedoes operate today much differently than they did in World War II. During World War II, the, the uh, torpedo was designed to be fired and bang against the side of a ship and then explode. Today's torpedoes are launched so that they actually go underneath the target, the target being like this, they actually, the torpedo actually goes underneath the target and then explodes underneath the target. And when it does that, it removes all the water underneath the ship, the target, and then the ship just collapses under its own weight. And that's the way a modern torpedo works in the Navy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. How significant was the activity of this Florida school person who did the report on McVeigh? 
and I suppose, and I've, I've read started this exoneration process. Well, it was fairly significant. He uh, he was 11 years old when he started on this as a school project, and uh, uh, one of the things that captured the attention of his story was the fact that he was 11 years old and that that's something that the media liked and authors liked and that became a sort of a story in itself about the 11 year old boy who who uh, actually ended up testifying before congress in an attempt to get captain mcveigh's record cleared so it was very significant and i met him one time a long time ago when he, when he was about 11 he's probably 20 now Does anyone else have a question? I'll be around here for a few minutes, I guess. Uh, oh, there's a question back here. Yes, Dr. Hake from Huntington, a dentist, uh, Dr. Hake from Huntington, brought a uh, drawing of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis that's on display back here, so anyone's welcome to take a look at that. Yes, sir. I wanted to say on the, you said there were four books. Written on it? Uh, I think it's seven now, actually. Well, I think I, I said six. Yeah. And they had, um, after the court martial, McVeigh and Hoshimoto. Hashimoto, yes. Hashimoto had a conversation. He says, Hey, I understand your shame. When you were going to with the bombs on board, I sighted you, but I couldn't get a line on you. In other words, he had spotted them, misidentified it, actually. He thought it was a cargo ship. He didn't see, get it clear enough. Uh, Periscope sighting to re realize it was it, but when he saw it the second time, oh yeah, I missed that. I'll get it this time. Good point. Yeah. Well, if you got it the first time, that slowed up the war a little bit. How long did it take for it to get back to the states? The wreck. How long did it take for? I'm sorry. News of the sinking of the Indianapolis was not released, I believe, until August the 16th. So it was over two weeks before it would actually hit the newspapers. And it was announced the same day that the Japanese surrender announcement was announced. So it became sort of a, a small story, which should have been a huge story and is a huge story. It became a small story because the headlines that day were Japanese, Japan surrenders. And down here was the story of the sinking of the heavy cruiser. USS Indianapolis. Uh, communications were a little bit different then than they are now, too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mary? Yeah, well, nothing. I just wanted to thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, we do have